Hey beautiful mamas, welcome to my live question and answer session. Welcome if you're doing something else, welcome if you've logged on just to have your question answered, welcome if you're listening to the recording. So it's great to be here and I'm hoping that there are going to be lots more lives because I'm launching a community very soon which is going to have two live question and answers every month to support you on your inner work journey. So that's going to be part of a new global community. If you're interested, please DM me, get on the waiting list. It's going to be amazing. So I've got my little book here. I've got some questions that people have already sent in and we're going to be going through those one by one. And if we have time at the end to do some live questions, then I'm here for you. So please put any questions in the comments. I haven't got any so far, but if you have any, please just go ahead and write them down and we'll get to those at the end. So let's jump in. Question one is from Voy. And voice said, I would like to know why I'm behaving towards my child, shouting, feeling out of control in ways that I never experienced from my parents. Where does this self-sabotage come from? Thank you, Voy. Great question. It's a really great question, actually, because I do talk a lot about the ways in which we end up saying and doing what our parents said and did to us when we go into a trauma response. Remember that when we go into a trauma response, this part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is where all the podcasts went in, all the books, all the learnings, all the mantras, all of the things that you know you should do, they're all here. But when we go into a trauma response and we feel unsafe or there's a perceived threat, this bit goes offline. So all of the things you learn, it's offline, it's not accessible, which is why we end up reacting in ways that we are surprised by. Often it can be really, you know, basically we're acting like a toddler or a child or a teenager. And that's because we're being taken back to those times because this part of the brain is kicking in, the survival brain. And we do often say or do what our parents did to us. So voice question is a good one because she's saying, why am I acting in ways that my parents never acted with me? Where does this come from? Why am I, I mean, I'm putting words into your mouth, Voy, but why am I a worse mother than what I experienced? So yes, we can have had certain behaviors role model to us. And of course we inherited those unconsciously because our parents were our universe. That's, you know, for a very long time, you don't realize that your childhood's, not normal, right? You, you assume that everyone had the same upbringing that you did. And we also pick up, um, we also, sorry, we also don't pick up things. We also are our own people. So we have nurture and we have nature. So nurture is where we're inheriting traits from our parents. They're being role modeled or they're being absorbed because our parents are indirectly or directly telling us some certain behaviors are good or bad. We are also nature, right? We are also our own people. So you will be reacting in the way that you react, which has nothing to do with your parents. So when, Voy, you say that you're shouting, feeling out of control, doing or saying things that you never experienced, this doesn't have anything to do with your parents. This has to do with your trauma response. So going back to what we said, when this bit goes offline, the survival brain, is what takes over and you will react, say, do things that are in line with your trauma response. That could be fight, shouting, fighting, hitting, wanting to manhandle, wanting to break. That's definitely mine. That's what I do. It could be flee. Maybe you want to be fleeing the room. You don't want to be there. Anything to escape. It could be fawning, doing anything to make it better, anything to appease whatever it is that's making you feel unsafe. And it could be, what's the other one? Fright, flight, flight, freeze, freeze. So freezing, zoning out, just basically kind of leaving your body, dissociating. So if your trauma response is to fight, to shout, to 
feel out of control, then that's your trauma response. And you are gonna react in a way that comes naturally, should we say, to you. So I hope that answers your question. In summary, it's not all about what our parents did. They are the ones that created the triggers. So they are the ones that will create the root cause of what it is that is putting you into a trauma response. But the way that you react is not necessarily to do with your parents. It could be, but it is also to do with your way of reacting. Fight, flight, freeze or fall. It's a bit of a tongue twister, that one. So thank you for that question, Boy, I hope that answered it. Let me know if it didn't. Please put in the chat if you've got any more questions. And if anyone else has any more questions along that question, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Question two, this is from Kate. Kate says, my question is, how does one deal with the immense disappointment and shame that comes about when one trips up or relapses? Basically, when one reverts to old ways, despite all the awareness, the continued attempts to accept and progress forward. How does one pick oneself back up and continue with enthusiasm and energy? Great question. So let's, pack, let's unpack this. The immense disappointment and shame that comes about when one trips up and relapses. So this is a wound. We all, we all trip up. We all relapse. We are human beings that make mistakes. We're not gods. Okay, so when you relapse, that should be something that doesn't provoke intense shame and disappointment. If it does, I would say that this comes from your childhood. Is getting things wrong something that you were punished for, rejected for, dismissed about, uh, sent to your room for? Maybe your parents ignored you when you made a mistake or you were made to feel bad. Perhaps your parents role modeled beating themselves up if they got something wrong. Maybe they needed to blame someone. It was always someone's fault. That's definitely the environment that I grew up in. I have to be really conscious of not assigning blame and just saying, it's okay, shit happens. It's no one's fault. So already that would be something that I would be looking at with you. This disappointment and shame, which you describe as immense, shouldn't be there. The fact that it's there, the fact that you're carrying it if you do something wrong, that means this comes from childhood. This is the way that you were made to feel as a child. So we would heal that first so that you are able to make a mistake without thinking that you're the worst person on earth. So that's that bit. The second bit, continued attempts to accept and progress forward. How does one pick oneself back up? You pick yourself back up because you learn to love yourself. You learn to accept yourself. You learn to see that you're enough. Even if you're screwing up daily, that's okay. That's enough. Because what is enough is the fact that you're trying. Even if you're screwing up, you're still trying, right? You're still practicing. And none of us, not one person on earth is getting this right all the time. So we have to understand that there's no standards by which we're being measured. All the parenting experts that you see out there, the conscious parenting tips, these are just guidelines. They're, they're theoretical guidelines that are just out there in the ether. No one, no one is following them perfectly every day. So I would also want to look at perfectionism with you. Why do you feel that you need to be making progress constantly, being enthusiastic, what else do you say, and energetic all the time. You're not gonna be. You're not gonna be because you're human. And remember, you're a woman. Women are cyclical beings. We have highs and lows of energy and emotion and hormones. You're not gonna be able to pick yourself up and feel, yay, I can't wait to parent again tomorrow because I really screwed up today. You're not gonna feel like that because that would be weird. And secondly, on the days before your bleed, for example, at certain points during your cycle, and definitely before your bleed, you're gonna not have that energy and you're not gonna have that emotional 
um, resilience that you might have throughout the rest of the month. And this is what's going to make you more sensitive and more prone to screw up. So in essence, the disappointment and shame that comes about, that's from your childhood. I would want to heal that. Despite all the awareness reverting to old ways, that's because these are wounds. Wounds will always trump mindset, always, always, always. However much you want to be a conscious parent, your wounds don't care, your inner child doesn't care, your trauma responses don't care. They will always come first. So that's why you revert. We have to heal the root cause. And lastly, how do you pick yourself back up with enthusiasm and energy? You don't need to, you don't need to trying your best sometimes, trying to be there most of the time, feeling that you're enough most of the time. This is what your kids need. Your kids notice when you try. They don't notice when you screw up. I mean, they do notice when you screw up. <laughs> they don't necessarily notice when you don't screw up, but they notice when you try. They notice when you make an effort. So we don't want to be spiraling. When you screw up, okay, I've screwed up. That's awful. I feel awful feel it for a couple of minutes and then let it go. Let it go because that shame is not getting you anywhere. It's not helping your kids. It's not undoing what you did. What you did is done. So you might as well use that energy into propelling you forwards into not doing the same again or trying not to do the same again. So hopefully that answered your question, Kate. Again, if it didn't, please put in the comments below what you have that's come up for you and I will try and address that. Let me just get a drink. Oh. Okay, question three. This is from Mao. Question three is, I'd like to go over why it's practically impossible. No, sorry, this is from Anna. Anna, question three, sorry, question four is a mole. Question three, I would like to go over why it's practically impossible to do conscious parenting if you suffered developmental trauma. Great question, Anna. And I know Anna, because Anna worked with me and I know she's got over this, she's healed this, but she said she just wanted to hear it again, summarized. So Anna, you are conscious parenting. I know that, you know that, but it's a great question, so let's go into it. So why is conscious parenting difficult if you've suffered from developmental trauma? It's something I've touched on already, actually. Developmental trauma, actually, let's just talk about what developmental trauma is. Developmental trauma is trauma that you experienced whilst your brain was developing, hence the development. It can also be referred to as attachment trauma in that it affects how you relate to other people, how you relate to yourself and how you relate to the world. So developmental trauma is small t trauma. It's not big t trauma. Big t trauma is more rape, car crash, plane crash, fire, that kind of horrendous thing. Small t trauma is more not feeling understood, not feeling loved, not feeling heard, not feeling seen. And these may seem kind of small, but they're huge. If you didn't feel loved, seen, understood as a child, when your brain was developing, you would have created all sorts of self-limiting beliefs about yourself, and these get wired into your brain. For example, I'm not worthy. It's not safe to show my emotions. If I'm vulnerable, I will get punished. Um, I'm not important. All of these kinds of things get wired in as beliefs and then your brain wants to create shortcuts. It wants to understand the world in the quickest, most efficient way that it can. It will hardwire those beliefs more and more if it sees evidence that backs those up. So every time that you experience uh, a situation where you feel, oh yeah, I'm not loved, Oh, yeah, it wasn't, I'm not important. Oh, yeah, I shared my feelings and, it, and it's, it wasn't a good outcome. Then your brain goes, cool, we've got a great new shortcut to understand the world. Let's hardwire that in. So this is developmental trauma. It's huge. It's not a one-off fire. It's not a one-off horrendous experience. It's the way that your brain 
developed. It's the way that you see the world. So it's really, really significant and impactful. So what we do together when you work with me is we work to undo these beliefs. They may be hardwired, but that doesn't mean that they can't be undone. And we do that through many different ways. But the point is, going back to Anna's question, why is it really difficult, practically impossible it feels, to conscious parent when you've got developmental trauma? Because you have these beliefs, these self-limiting beliefs, that are getting in the way of what you would like to be, how you would like to act, you know, all of these things. So you may have these conscious parenting ideals, respectful parenting ideals, gentle parenting approaches that you want to adopt. But if you don't feel worthy, if you don't feel lovable, if you don't feel that your opinions or your needs or your feelings are important, obviously this is going to affect how you show up as a conscious parent. Of course it is. So this is why developmental trauma really gets in the way of you showing up as the mama that you want to be. Add to this your inner child. Your inner child is the energy of your child that you still have within you, whatever your age. If she didn't receive the love, validation and attention that she needed, then she will be in the driving seat of your life and she will be looking for these things everywhere, including your children. So you can see you've got a conflict here. You've got your respectful, gentle, parenting, conscious approaches here, and you've got your inner child here, and then you've got your limiting self-beliefs in the middle somewhere. The inner child and the limiting self-beliefs, they're gonna gang up on, on your mindset. Your mindset's never gonna win against two competing interests, which are far stronger than it. So this is how developmental trauma will get in the way of the way you want to parent. And this is a, such an important question because we're not saying, oh, I might as well give up then. Can't conscious parent because I can't because I've got developmental trauma. No, the whole point is, if you know that you experienced a challenging childhood where your needs weren't necessarily met in the way that you wanted them to be, then you need to do the work, right? That's all it's telling you. It's saying you need to do the work. And when you've done the work and you've integrated your wounds and you've healed your past and you've made peace with the, your parents, then the deck is clear for you to then take up these parenting approaches. So this is a hopeful message. It's telling you that it's not your fault. If you are finding conscious parenting impossible, and I found it impossible, I could not do it, and it made me feel shit. I've told Janet Lansbury already, she found it funny. I was following her, I was told to follow her because I was told she was a great parenting guru, which of course she is, she's amazing. I followed her before I'd done this work for about two weeks and I had to unfollow her because I was feeling so rubbish because I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Why couldn't I do it? It wasn't my fault. It was because I had trauma that I hadn't healed. Now that I've healed that, yes, I can. Not perfectly, no one does it perfectly, but I can do it because the trauma is not tripping me up. So that, hopefully, Anna has answered your question as to why conscious parenting can feel really, really difficult if you've experienced developmental or attachment trauma. Okay, question four. This question is from Mao. I would like to understand what it means to release an emotion from the past. Does it involve something like crying or shouting in the woods? Or is it simply a mental process? Can it be done in the moment when the emotion gets triggered? Great question. I get asked this a lot because I know I talk about releasing past emotions a lot because this really is a key part of this work. So <clears throat> where should we start with this? Uh, let's talk about how these emotions get stuck and then it makes sense to talk about how we release them. So, building on from the question before actually, developmental trauma is 
experiencing a childhood and adolescence where you didn't feel loved, validated, seen, understood in the way that you needed in order to thrive. If you didn't receive this, then most likely you will have swallowed your needs, swallowed the feelings that you felt you were being told directly and indirectly didn't, weren't convenient, were a burden, were too much, weren't enough, whatever it was that your parents said to you about these traits. It could be that you were too bossy or too shy or too sensitive or too dramatic or too loud or whatever the hell it was that your parents labelled you as, you would have taken that on board and tried your best, because this is what children do, they want more than anything love and attention, that you would have tried your best to then be what your parents wanted you to be. And that would have involved becoming inauthentic because you're not a little monkey that can be exactly who other people think you should be, right? So you would have then started to swallow feelings and needs that didn't correspond or weren't in alignment with who your parents wanted you to be. That's normal. It's the way that you got through. It was the healthy thing to do at the time. It's how you survived. So the problem is these feelings and needs that you swallow, I always think of a like a box that you've got here in your chest. It just gets stuffed in and stuffed in and then the lid shuts. And it, it takes up a huge amount of energy to keep these needs and feelings down, which is why if you don't do the work to release these old stuck feelings, it's very likely that you end up having physical symptoms because your body it just can't hold them down for much longer. It, it's not a good thing to have inside. So how do we release these feelings? Like Mao said, does it involve something like crying or shouting in the woods or is it simply a mental process? So it can be both. Let's start with the mental. It can be a mental process. In fact, it's entirely a mental process on one level because when we release feelings, there are two ways in which we can do it. We can do it unconsciously and we could do it consciously. If we are releasing our feelings unconsciously, it's because they are overflowing from this box into which you stuff them. So things like panic attacks, things like losing your shit on your kids disproportionately at a trigger. Things like bursting into tears, not being able to stop crying at the smallest thing. Obviously that could be many things, but these could be ways in which you are unconsciously letting some of the pressure off this box from childhood into which you stuffed everything in. That's unconscious. Unconscious release is fine. It's like we said, letting go of some pressure, but it's not really fair on the people we do it on. It's not fair on our kids, it's not fair on our partner, and often we, we release unconsciously onto the people we love the most because we feel the safest with them. So that's not really fair. So what we want to do is to take a mental approach. We want to consciously release our grief, consciously release our anxiety, consciously release our anger. So this is a very, it is a very mental process. We're making a decision to set aside time and space to do this. So does this involve, what did you say, crying or shouting in the woods? It can do. If that is something that feels good to you and that is what you want to do to release, then absolutely crying and shouting in the woods would be two great examples of consciously releasing your feelings. However, however, this is important. To consciously release our feelings, so the conscious release is the kind of vehicle, we need a target, right? We need a target, or at least it's much easier if we have a target. So the target has to be the root cause of these feelings, and that's the bit that's a little bit more tricky. So if you want to consciously release the feelings that you stuffed in from childhood, we need to do some background work as to what these feelings are attached to and who they're attached to. Then we have a target, and it's mainly our parents, no surprises there. We then have a target to channel these feelings towards. This is something that I do with my clients. We do a lot of work on unpacking where their feelings come from, which experiences 
they are linked to, which themes in their life did they experience, such as not feeling important, feeling dismissed, being treated unfairly. And then you know where you're channeling these feelings. Your other question, can it be done in the moment? Absolutely, that's kind of a different sort of feeling. So if you want to be doing the release work to clear this box so that the triggers that you have now are no longer there, then we need a target and then we consciously release them towards that target. And there are various ways in which you can do it. You can do it journaling, you can shout, you can scream, you can move your body, all sorts of ways that appeal to you. So you need to think about what way feels good for me. Or we do it in the moment. And that's when we are releasing motion, uh, emotions that come up naturally as part of being a human. So if you feel sad or if you feel anxious or if you feel ashamed, then it's a slightly different process. You're making space for it. You're making space for it. You're welcoming it. And this also comes back to your childhood. Were you allowed to feel your feelings when you were a child? Were you allowed to express them? Were they welcome? Were certain feelings welcome and certain feelings unacceptable? This is again all part of the background work which helps you to understand why you might struggle to release certain feelings. So <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. We've got old stuck feelings that are here that need a target and that need to be released consciously in order to clear the root causes of your triggers. We also have feelings that are passing through our body constantly. We are human beings. We are messy, intense, emotional women. So these feelings, which are just energy, they don't want to be stuck in you. They don't want to be stuck in you. So don't push them back down. Don't try and distract yourself from them. Don't try and numb out from them. Don't try and change them. Don't try and judge them. Ideally, we want to try and be a clear, open channel. We're letting them flow through us. So in order to do that, we need to ask ourselves, how are we feeling? What feeling wants to pass through me in this moment? Carve out time, if you can, in the moment. If you can't do in the moment, that's also okay. Then what I do, I have my inner parent there who says, oh, I can see you're feeling really anxious right now. Yeah, it's gonna be tricky to release that right now. We're with blah, blah, we've got the kids, we're doing something with whatever we're doing. But I promise you, I will help you to release them later. Okay, so the same kind of thing that you might say to your children, I can't play later, I can't play now, but I definitely will come and play with you later, right? So you're saying the same to that part of you that is feeling these big emotions, whatever that part is, could be your child, in an adolescent, your inner, your inner adult. You're saying to yourself, I see that you're feeling this, we're acknowledging it, and then you have to carve out time and space later to do that work to be with it and to release it in whatever way feels helpful. So I hope that answered your question, Mao. It's both a mental and a physical process. It depends what kind of feelings you're releasing, old or current. Let me know if that didn't answer your question or if that triggers any questions for anyone else. Okay, question five. This question is from Janine. I have been aware of inner child work for several years. I've tried many times to do it, but can't access or solve any issues. And I can't determine what exactly it is that I need help on. How does your program guarantee results? Or do you have advice on progressing with inner child work? Great question. So let's unpack that one. Um, not being able to access or solve issues or determine what exactly it is that you need help on. Inner work's really, really hard. It's really, really deep. As we've mentioned before, we're talking about developmental trauma. We're talking about deep wounds from your childhood and adolescence. They are all there, they're in you. It's not like they've disappeared anywhere. That doesn't mean, however, that it's easy to access. The part of you that experienced this trauma will not want to go there. <laughs> she doesn't want to go there at all. So the part of you that experienced the pain, the suffering, the grief, the anger, the frustration, she's going to put up 
every single block, every single excuse that she can think of for her not to feel that pain again, right? That's completely normal. She's like, are you kidding? You want me to go back there? You want me to feel that pain again? No, I'm not doing it. So if you're doing this work by yourself, which it sounds as though you are, you're gonna come across a lot of resistance because part of you doesn't want to. And also part of you doesn't feel safe doing it. Where's the person holding space for her to do that? Where's the person co-regulating her through those experiences? She wants these things because she didn't get this as a child or adolescent. This is part of developmental trauma, not being taught how to regulate your feelings. So if you're doing this by yourself or trying to, it can feel really impossible. It's not your fault. It just means that the trauma either isn't ready to be seen or you need support. You need a safe other, whoever that other is, a therapist, a coach, uh, a good friend. You need someone, ideally someone trauma informed, who can hold space for you to do this work. That is what is going to create the safety and it takes time. Don't think that it's, you know, oh, I've got someone else here. Yeah, sure, I'll jump into my trauma. It takes time. That part of you needs to trust that other person. Not only trust that she's safe to open up to, but trust that that person is capable of holding space for what she needs to do. So you need to choose that person carefully and it's a process. It might take, it might take time before that part of you feels safe enough to trust. So I guess what I'm saying is this is very difficult work to do on your own. I would reach out and try and get support with it, especially the parts that you're not sure about accessing. Because also if someone's holding space for you, they can also see the big picture, right? So they can see the themes that might be coming up, which you can't necessarily see because you're too in it. So obviously inner parenting is part of this process. And when you have received the support you need from a safe other, you can then use your inner parent to be that safe other. This is what I teach my clients to do, to create this connection with their inner parent so that their inner parent is then the one that creates safety and holds space for whatever it is that comes up. But that's very difficult to do at the beginning. You really do need someone else to model being that inner parent for you until you can do it for yourself. So it's not your fault that this is really, really difficult. I would get support and then by all means, start using an inner parent. Your inner parent is this other person, albeit imaginary, who is co-regulating you through your big feelings. So that is why you're finding it difficult to access. The second part of your question, how does your program guarantee results? I don't. I don't guarantee results because I can't, right? This is your process. I can guarantee that I am there for you every single step of the way. I can guarantee that I am going to love you fiercely through this process. I can guarantee that I will give you all of the tools in my arsenal and all of the experience that I have picked up, both personal from my life and professional from doing this for many years, but I can't guarantee that you are gonna get the results that you want because I'm not in your body. I can't feel what it is that you need. And yes, you set goals with me and those goals are absolutely the coat hanger on which the entire program is hanging, if you like, we have a process and the goals are what are driving us. That is the result that you want, but I can't guarantee how your psyche is going to react or whether you are ready to do this work. Obviously, there are lots of checks and balances that we do at the beginning to see that you are, and I've had very, very few examples of people that haven't been ready, but even those people that haven't been ready have, have changed immeasurably so it depends what the results are that you want but there are no guarantees because this is inner work it's not like i can guarantee you're going to lose weight or i'm going to guarantee you're you know with a facelift you're going to look younger <laughs> it's not possible to guarantee inner work but that doesn't mean that i don't guarantee like i said that i'm a thousand percent there for you this was my journey my program is built on the tools that made 
sense to me. I'm a very practical person. I'm a very intuitive person. So I will do my best to match my tools, my experience to you. And like I said, I've, I can count on the fingers of one hand, less than one hand, out of hundreds and hundreds of clients who I've seen for now eight years, those that, and I wouldn't even say they weren't happy with the results, they were, it's just perhaps they got different results. So yeah, sorry, can't give you guarantees, but I hope you understand why at least now. And the last part of your question, do you have any advice on progressing with inner child work? Yes, absolutely. Where I would start with in terms of doing this on your own is looking at your triggers. What are the things that trigger you the most? What are the feelings that come up with you, will come up for you when you are disproportionately reacting to your kids, your parents, someone in the call center, whoever it is? So what are the triggers and what are the feelings that this brings up in you? How do these feelings manifest in your body? And how old is that part of you that is reacting in this way? Because we know if you're having a disproportionate reaction, for a start, you know it's disproportionate because it feels totally out of control. It feels very visceral. It's very physical. It's pretty horrible. So it's not like a normal reaction and you will get a whole guilt shame cycle afterwards. But that reaction, that will be coming from a part of you that's, that's younger because that trigger is based on an earlier experience that you haven't yet healed. So I would start there. That is how we progress inner child work, by contacting our inner child, by asking how old is the part of me that is feeling this right now? So that is what you could start straight away, connecting to that wounded part of you, connecting to the feelings that she hasn't yet expressed because she wasn't able to, or she was scared of doing so. Connecting to that part of you that's carrying all this baggage which is stopping you from showing up in the way that you want to show up because she's dragging in this backpack of hers all of these self-limiting beliefs that aren't even true. So that is how you would start off, by connecting. I do this all the time because, you know, she's in your heart. All of these parts of you are in your heart. So connecting to your inner child first and trying to feel compassion for her, feeling acceptance for her. Many of my clients often feel a little bit of resistance towards her. It can be like, oh, she's so needy. She's so vulnerable. She's so weak. Yeah, she is. She's all of those things. But we have to learn to accept this and love her, right? Love her through her neediness. It's not her fault she's needy. It's not her fault she, she's vulnerable. It's not her fault she's weak. Of course she is. She's a child. She didn't know what was going on. She experienced developmental trauma. So the first step really is understanding that she didn't ask for any of what she went through. She was a child. Your parents were adults. So it's shifting any sense of shame and blame onto our primary caregivers, onto our parents. And that then starts this process of allowing you to connect to this poor little child in you that is innocent and trusting and loving and she didn't know what the hell was going on, right? So connecting to her, that is how I would recommend that you start this process. And like I said, if you want help releasing past experiences, I'd really get someone to help you with that. Some safe other who can hold space for you and teach you how to inner parent yourself. Hope that answered your question. Okay, question five. We've got eight, by the way. Five, eight, eight in total. No, nine. Nine in total. So, five. This question is from Janine. No, we've just done that one. Sorry, guys. Question six. This is from Ashton. Question six. What do you consider the most successful ways of releasing trauma, such as deep-rooted self-doubt and shame? Great question. All these questions are amazing, by the way. Thank you. You've obviously really dug deep and thought hard about what it is that you're struggling with. So thank you. So Ashton, what are the most successful ways of releasing trauma? The most successful ways of releasing trauma are, I kind of touched on this earlier, understanding the root cause of the trauma. Releasing is a conscious process. It needs a vehicle and it needs a target. So you mention self-doubt and shame. 
Let's start there. Self-doubt, where did it come from? Who made you doubt yourself? And you may well say, oh, well, you know, I've always doubted myself. It's just a voice in my head. It's me. It's not you. You weren't born doubting yourself, right? You weren't born feeling ashamed of yourself. This comes from the outside. You inherited these labels. You inherited these unconscious beliefs about yourself. I can't believe in myself. I'm not enough. I'm bad. Whatever they were, you inherited from them from outside. Who were the most influential people in your childhood? Your parents, your primary caregivers. Of course they were. They were your universe, like I said at the beginning. You thought, probably for a very long time, as we all do, that your childhood was normal for many years because you didn't know anything different. So you will have, ex you will have inherited these labels and these labels may have been role model to you. So if your parents felt they doubted themselves or if your parents felt ashamed of who they were, they weren't able to be confidently authentic, then they may have role modeled behavior that you then adopted because you thought that was normal. So the target is our parents. They are the people that you inherited your self-doubt and your shame from. We would then go into when were you made to doubt yourself? When were you made to feel ashamed? Was it certain behaviors? Was it certain experiences that you had? One-off experiences where you, you know, did something that you were then punished for? What are the experiences that you haven't integrated yet that we need to heal? So that would then be the areas that we would look at, the memories that you would look at in order to release these old stuck feelings and the people that we would look at to target our feelings. So we're taking a two-pronged approach, but the bottom line is you have self-doubt and shame that are stuck. You inherited it, they're not yours. They are stuck in your body, you don't need them. They're using up vast amounts of energy to keep them down. We want to release them. So we do that in a conscious way, you can journal these feelings, you can shout them out, you can move your body, you can dance them out, you can hit, rip, break, whatever it is that suits you and feels good. But we want to do it in a way that someone is holding space for you. So this is coming back to a question from earlier. It's very difficult to do this work if you don't feel safe. And like I said earlier, a part of you isn't gonna want to do this work because she's like, are you kidding? I'm not feeling that shame again. It was horrendous. I nearly died when I was feeling it. Remember, it was so bad. It was so bad, that shame and that self-doubt, that she stuffed it down. She couldn't feel it. It was too big. She wasn't psychologically evolved enough to feel it. So remember this, but this is in context, right? If you are going to feel it, you're gonna be taken back to that part of you that first felt it. And that, that's a pretty horrible, deep, difficult experience. So you do really need support with this. So again, like I said earlier, if you can find a safe other who can hold space for you to go there, to release this shame and self-doubt, amazing. Hopefully that person can then also teach you how to do this for yourself and then your inner parent will be able to do it for you. The good news is when you go back to the root experience of the shame and the self-doubt, you only need to do that once, literally once. It's not nice, it's hard, it's horrible. You will feel overwhelmed by that feeling as it is coming out, but you only need to do it once because it, it clears it. Does that mean that we never feel shame again? Of course not, but it means that you don't feel that original shame again, because that original shame is what's getting stirred up by whatever things in your life are reminding you of the experience that created that feeling in the first place. So yes, of course you'll feel shame and self-doubt again, we're human beings but that you will be able to manage. That is about sitting there with the feelings, being the open channel that we talked about earlier. The original shame and self-doubt from your childhood, your adolescence, you need support with. So I hope that answered your question. And 
Yeah, you can release it. That's the good news. You can release it. I promise you, you can release it. You just need to find the support to do it with. And of course, I mean, I haven't mentioned me. Of course, I'm here to do that with you. Please reach out if it feels appropriate for me to do this for you. Of course, I'm here. But of course, other people can do this as well if you feel comfortable with them. Question seven. How do you best deal with rage? For example, when a boundary is crossed by a family member, but you've got an 18 month old with you. Good question, Becky. So this is how do you deal with rage, but you can't necessarily do everything that you might want to because you've got your child there. So you don't want them thinking you've gone crazy. So I did touch on this before. I'll say it again. If we're feeling a big emotion that we feel we can't release in the moment because it's not appropriate, what I do is I get my inner parent, my person over here, my safe, loving, soothing, kind, tolerant, patient, imaginary parent or friend or support, whatever I need in the moment, I get them to say to me, I really see that you are mad right now. You are fucking angry and you want to let it out. So you're getting her to validate you. Wow, there's a really big feeling there. Just that actually will diffuse some of the rage that you're feeling. Having someone there going, whoa, you are really angry. I'm not surprised. It makes complete sense that you are feeling this way. So getting your inner parent, first of all, to validate you. I know I do this, but it's like she's over here for me. <laughs> so she's out here. She's not in you. She's out there. She's someone other than you. So you get her to validate you. Then she soothes you. That's the two things that the inner parent always does. When she soothes you, she can say, I know you can't release it now, but I promise you I'm going to help you do it later. Okay, so she's saying it's okay. I've got you. You're not alone. I'm going to help you with this. Again, that diffuses some of the feeling. She's just saying I can't do it now because you can't do it now. And then later, it's really important to carve out that time and space to go back to the feeling. It may not be there anymore. That's okay. The important thing is that you made time to connect to an inner parent, or rather more importantly, the part of you that was feeling that rage felt seen and heard. This is probably something that she never felt as a child or adolescent. She may never have felt seen or heard in her rage. So just that little part there, getting your inner parent to validate what you're feeling and say, I've got you, I'm coming back to this, as a good parent should have done when you were a child or adolescent, that will help heal this. So even when you go back to a time and a space that you do have time to feel your rage and it's not there, that's okay. You've done a really good piece of inner parenting. If the rage is there, then of course there's plenty of ways that you can release it that you would already know because you don't have your 18 month year old with you. So that's what I would say um, to do in the moment. I would also say that if the rage feels manageable, so it's not necessarily a trigger, if you just feel really angry, you're not disproportionately going into what I call is the red zone where you're just seeing red and you, you go a bit crazy. If you're, you've got it, you, you're, you're you know, sufficiently present to be observing that you're really, really angry, then role model, role model good, healthy ways of getting rid of your rage. Even if your 18 month old is there, why not? She or he, I don't know the sex of your, your baby, but they will pick up on your healthy way of managing your big feelings. So I'll give you some examples that my clients have used with their children. And the next week or the next two weeks, their children have gone and done this by themselves. And that is saying out loud, wow, I'm feeling really angry now. I'm gonna go and hit a pillow. Do you want to hit a pillow with me? Do you feel a bit angry? Should we do that together? And literally hitting a pillow or whacking a pillow. There's nothing wrong with that. You are saying to your toddler, ooh, I've got a big feeling. Doesn't feel that good. I've got a way that we can release it. Shall we do it together? And then they're seeing you come back down from that emotion, right? So you're, you're saying, I'm noticing a big emotion. It doesn't feel good. Here it is. Let's let it out. Oh, I feel much better. So you are taking your toddler on that curve with you. 
How amazing is that? Was that ever done for you? I'm guessing not. So this is how we teach our children to regulate their emotions, not only through co-regulating them, but through role modeling how we manage our big emotions. You can also say, I'm gonna go and have a scream. I wanna shout. Do you wanna shout? I feel like screaming. Go and scream, scream into a pillow, scream into a sock. Whatever it is that you feel comfortable doing with your toddler there. But that's great role modeling. And like I said, I've had many clients whose children have then gone, I'm feeling really angry. I need to scream. And then they scream or they've just gone, I'm feeling really sad. I'm going to go and hit a cushion. Isn't that amazing? Isn't this what we want to teach our kids? So don't feel scared of role modeling a big emotion with your children. They are perfectly capable of witnessing it. And actually it's healthy to say what you are doing because then your actions and your words and your energy are all in alignment. And the problem comes, our children feel unsafe and confused when you are feeling really rageful and you're pretending that it's all fine. That's not good. Your child is going to pick up on your energy of rage. They're going to see that you're pretending because it's going to be obvious to them. And what's that going to tell them? That rage isn't acceptable or that we have to put a brave face on rage or why is mummy not letting me know that she's feeling rage? Does that mean that I'm unsafe? Is there a reason she can't tell me? All sorts of things will start kicking off in their brain, even though they're little, you know, it's an unconscious process, but they will start to doubt your feelings and how you're communicating them. So authenticity is so important. So I would say, let that rage out. And then we've got the third option. You said it's a family member that's crossing boundaries. If your, ba if your family member is there with you, so you feel uncomfortable going, I'm just going to go and scream because you've really pissed me off, which I can understand might not always be appropriate. Then this is about, and this is a process of course, learning to exert healthy boundaries. Why are you letting that family member cross a boundary? Because a boundary is there. That person is stepping over it, sure, but you're also allowing them to step over it. Now, this could be for so many reasons, obviously, but I'm guessing that a part of it, one of those reasons is because as a child, you let them cross that boundary because as a child, you were helpless, you were powerless. You're not a child anymore. You're a mum. You've got your own children. So your duty really is to do this inner work, understand and heal why you're allowing that family member to cross the boundary and integrate the experiences that have led to you still perpetuating that dynamic with that person. It's not healthy. That person shouldn't be doing that. It's all very well in your mind, you know that, but you need to do the feeling work, the releasing work to advocate for that inner child that had their boundaries crossed, make her feel confident and strong again, that's the whole process, so that that person knows their place, so that you can say, um, that's not okay. Uh, I, don't my, I don't let my children do that, so I'm not going to let you do that. Or it doesn't feel comfortable when you say that to me. Or whatever it is, if you're answering too quickly, uh, that's interesting, can I get back to you? Buying yourself some time, right? So different scenarios there for you. Yes, of course, release the emotion in the moment if you can. If you can't, get your inner parent to notice it. Then definitely go back later to a time where you can release it with your inner parent and understand why you're letting that family member cross your boundaries. Do the inner work that you need to understand where that wound has come from and how to heal it. Hope that was helpful. Okay, so next question. This is from, I think it's pronounced Jamie. Sorry, Jamie, if that's not correct. It's either Jamie or Jamie. I'm assuming it's Jamie, but Sorry if I've got that wrong. Jamie says, how do I get rid of the resentment, anger, hatred, frustration, and grief towards my parents? How do I physically make that happen? What actions can I take to do this? So a lot of questions about releasing. Um, this is about 
what we said before. It's about understanding where this resentment, anger, hatred, frustration and grief has come from. Why do you feel anger, hatred, resentment, grief? Is it because you didn't feel understood? Is it because your mother's or father's feelings came first? Is it because you were made to feel that you weren't enough or that you were stupid or that you were too sensitive? Where have these feelings come from? Who were the people that made you feel them? Mainly it's our parents. It can also be other primary caregivers. For example, figures of authority. It could be a head teacher. It could be extended family. It could be uh, parents of a best friend, for example. Mainly it's our parents. But think big picture. Who made me feel this anger, resentment, hatred, grief? Why? How old is the part of me that is feeling these feelings? Then you know where to direct your attention. Is it your childhood? Is it your adolescence? Ideally, we want to go back to the earliest time possible because this is when you first created those self-limiting beliefs. This is when they first got wired into your developing brain. That's why it's called developmental trauma. So we're giving context to these feelings. These aren't feelings for no, they're not there for no reason. It's not like you were born feeling, you know, this way. You know that it's towards your parents. You've already told us. So the work for you would be, why did I feel this way? How did they make me feel this way? And then, like we've said before, you can release them by targeting them towards your parents through writing, through screaming, shouting, moving your body. And if these feelings are very deep, which they may very well be, I would get the support from a safe other to hold space for you while you learn how to do this for yourself. Otherwise, like I said before, that part of you is going to come up with every reason under the sun why it shouldn't do it because she doesn't want to. It's too scary. It's too scary, right? So you need that support at the beginning. So what actions can you take? Find someone that's trauma informed, that can hold space for you at the beginning to do this early, early childhood release work. And then when you know how to do it yourself, by all means, get your inner parent to do it. It can be any kind of actions that resonate with you. If you like to move your body, move your body. If you like to draw it out, draw it out. If you like to journal it out, journal it out. If you wanna scream it out, scream it out. There's millions of ways in which you can release these feelings and it's the way that resonates with you. Try all of them. This is not the last question, it's the second to last question. This is from Annie. Any tips for remembering to do my inner child work regularly? It doesn't spring to mind at the right moments, more on reflection at a later time. So Annie is also someone I have worked with before, so I know she knows how to do inner child work brilliantly. It's one of her biggest tools. And like everyone, she's saying she forgets to do it. That, that makes sense, right? We're not always on top of our game with inner work. We're busy. We're busy people with millions of things on. So how can you remember to do your inner child work? I would say to get back in the habit by doing what I suggest that you do at the very beginning to create that very first connection with your inner parent. Do it every night. So what I suggest that my clients do is create a process once a night. I suggest night because that's the time that we have the least amount of distractions, right? It's We've kind of got to the end of our to-do list. The kids are in bed, it's quiet. Connect to your inner parent. Spend a couple of minutes getting her to do the things that I said earlier that she always does. She validates and she soothes. That's what she does, validating, soothing. Do it again every night for a couple of minutes. That is gonna create that connection again or reconnect if that connection's become a bit week or you've forgotten, do it every night, I'd say for two weeks, maybe even one week, but definitely minimum one week, and then you will remember that your inner parent is the greatest tool you've got in your belt, and she will more readily come to mind in those moments that you need inner parenting. Another thing that you can do is have a photo. Have a photo of yourself as a child, yourself as an adolescent, any part of you that you feel is the part that needs the most inner parenting. Have that by your bedside at nighttime. You know, just remember that 
You have that inner child within you, whatever your age. You have that inner adolescent within you, whatever your age. And that your adult self also needs inner parenting. But having a photo of your inner child might, might re, you know, rejig that, that memory. So hopefully that helps, Annie. Last question. My question is, and this is from Darlene, at 58 years old, why do I let my 94-year-old live-in mother mistreat me? She's been living with me for seven years and will be moving out in a few weeks to another daughter. I've had enough and I've lost my entire family during this process. The move is better for mother and me, but she still has a way of making me feel like a piece of crap. Tell me, she tells me I'm ridiculous and too sensitive. That's not good, Darlene. That's not good. It's not good because you are not a piece of crap, because you are not ridiculous and you are not too sensitive. And you know this, part of you knows this, because that's why you wrote in. Part of you knows that your mother is saying things that, albeit make you feel crap, but they're not true. Part of you knows that they're not true. This is the part that's like, how can I stop this? This is crazy, I don't want it anymore. The key is you have another part of you and that other part of you, your wounded inner child, absolutely thinks that this is true. She thinks that she is ridiculous and she thinks that she is too sensitive. And your mother is getting you to fall back into this place because she's living with you. I think it's a great thing that she is moving out because that will allow you to get the distance that you need from your mother in order to start to build your inner child back up again, in order to heal the wounds that were made a long, long time ago by your parents. And we need space for that. So I do have a number of clients whose parents live with them or that they see very often. It's not always possible to create no contact. And that would never be something that I would make you do or suggest that you do. I do always suggest, however, that you create as much distance as you feel comfortable creating. And this is because childhood wounds, let's give it an analogy, it's a little bit like a cut. If you have a cut on your hand and that cuts quite deep, if you keep putting that cut under the tap under running water, that cut is never gonna create the scab that it needs in order to heal. When the scab's on the cut, yeah, sure, you can put the, the cut, your hand, under the tap a few times, several times. It's got a scab, so it's not going to fester, it's not gonna open up again. But you need that time to create a scab. That time and that space to create the scab comes from lessening the contact with your parents. And that's because if you are in constant contact with that parent, you are constantly in your inner child. You can't not be. It's, it's, it will be practically impossible to move out of that headspace. So your mother's moving out, great. Before she's moved out, you've got her living with you. So it's about, limiting the contact in the way that you can to the bare minimum. Because in those moments that you're not with her, you can do the work that you need, which I'm gonna to come to in a minute, to help you shore up that inner child and heal those wounds. So first of all, limit the contact that you have. And if you're, I'm talking to other people that may have, who may be seeing their parents a lot, again, try and give that relationship a little bit of space. If you're speaking to them every day, try speaking to them every other day. If you're speaking them to them twice a week, try speaking to them once a week. If you're speaking to them once every week, try speaking to them every two weeks, right? Do whatever you feel comfortable with. That is going to allow you maximum space to come into your adult self. The adult self that you are when you're at work, when you're with your partner, when you're living normal life. So that's the first thing. Secondly, when you have this space, you want to be in a parenting that child. Obviously, really, you want to be healing the wounds. 
that's something that I would do with you. That's something that someone else could do with you who is trauma informed. It's a big, long process. We want to understand why that inner child feels, like I said, like crap. And what is the hold that your mother has over her? For example, I'm presuming that there was some kind of choice involved in your mother moving in with you or not, given that she's now moving to another daughter. Why did you take her on first or perhaps second or whenever you took her on? Why did you allow her to move in? So sometimes it feels like we have no choice, that we just had to do it. She's our mum, we're obligated, I'm a good daughter, it's what I had to do. It's not always that black and white. So I would get you to start thinking about why you felt obligated, why you felt it was your duty. Obviously, it's a beautiful thing to do. You opened your heart, you opened your home to your mother. But look what's happening. At what cost? At what cost did you take on that emotional burden? It's helped you. What did you say? You said, I, I've lost my entire family during this process. Those odds aren't balanced right so why did you let her do this why did that part of you agree to do this this is what you want to heal that dynamic is not healthy it's not healthy we want to make it healthy you want to be treating your mum and viewing your mum as an adult because you are an adult you are 58 you're not five you're not eight you are an adult and you can do this so please feel hopeful it's absolutely possible to heal this you need the space and you need someone to go through exactly why your mother has this hold on you. So your question is, why do you let her mistreat you? Because she mistreated you as a child. And because you are going back into your inner child when she's around, that inner child feels helpless and powerless. You're not in your adult. So you need to work backwards, heal that part of you that feels helpless, so that she doesn't feel helpless anymore. We do this with the inner parent. And then when you are more able to be in your adult around your mother, you can lay healthy boundaries. You will not allow her to mistreat you anymore. Hope that makes sense. And yeah, good luck with that because you don't deserve this. And I'm really glad she's moving out. That's gonna give you exactly the headspace that you need to do the next step of your healing. So those are all the questions that I have from the questions that I got sent earlier. Let me quickly look if I've got any questions in the chat. Doesn't look like we have, just going through it once more time quickly. No, we have no questions live. So I hope that that was helpful, guys. I hope that you learned a little bit about inner parenting, about your inner child, about how to release these big feelings that you might have, about why you might have these feelings there in the first place, about developmental trauma, what it is, how to heal it, and lots more. So this call is going to be saved on my grid. So please feel free to come back to it if you weren't able to attend live or if I answered your question before you joined, it will be on my grid. And please know that, like I said at the beginning, these question and answer sessions are gonna be part of what I offer my new global community that I am so excited about. I'm gonna be launching it hopefully before the end of the year, if not very soon in the new year. And it's gonna be an amazing program, though I say it myself, it's a very, very deep, program it's got three parts acknowledging your trauma healing your trauma beyond your trauma and everything that i've talked about today is in that course everything that i do with my one-to-one -one clients is in that course it's literally been like a verbal mental spiritual dump it's all in there in a self-led course which you will have access to for life and you'll be part of a community Facebook group, obviously, peer-to-peer -peer support, but I will be helping you with whatever it is that comes up on this course, because it's self-led, twice a month. You can bring your questions, your fears, your worries, your queries, anything to this global community, and I will be answering them live. So if you liked today, if you found it helpful, if you want to join my global community, please give me a thumbs up, 
or actually even better, why not um, tell me, oh, I've got one question, maybe we've got time for that. Um, yes, yeah, send me a DM telling me that you wanna join and I will send you the details. Okay, we've got one question from Jamie. Yes, Jamie, I asked your question earlier. Let me just say, see what it says. You say go back to the earliest time possible. What if I were in my mother's tummy? and right after I was born until I was one. I can't recall what happened, but I know it happened. Okay, that's a really good question, Jamie. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, you were obviously not gonna remember when you were in the womb, of course not, and you probably won't remember when you were one. Let me just go back to your question, actually. How do you get rid of the resentment? Yeah, so if you can't, access a memory that is the earliest time that you felt these things and if you know that they happened in the womb that's fine but you also know that you felt them later so we can't go back to the womb but we can go back to when you were maybe three or four or five or six or seven or eight and those would be the memories that we would work on to heal these wounds so when do you remember feeling the resentment, the anger, the hatred, the frustration and the grief when you were a child. It doesn't have to be the earliest time. It helps if it's early because that's when your brain was developing, remember? But it doesn't have to be the earliest time. We're trusting our psyche. We can say to our psyche, please give me a memory of when I felt these things that I need to work on. And your psyche will come up with the memory that you need. It's a little bit like when you, you know, when you forget a name, you're like, oh, what's that name? And two days later, you're like, oh, there it is. It comes out of the blue. If you ask your psyche for a significant memory when you first felt these feelings, and it's probably gonna be several because the feelings are quite different, your psyche will come up with it. That would be the memory that you would work with. You would need support to work with that memory. I tell you how to do this in the course that I just mentioned, or of course you can work with me or any other trauma-informed person that can do this work, but that's how you would work with the memory. If you don't have any memories at all, and at the beginning of the process, it's quite common to just draw a blank and feel like, well, I can't remember anything. Don't worry, these feelings come back. They slowly come back as that part of you that experienced these challenges feels safer. This has happened in 99.9% .9 of my clients. If, however, you happen to be the only person that never remembers anything, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, then we work with the feeling. You don't have to have the memory, you can just work with the feeling. Because if you think about it, the feeling is what is stuck, right? You had this experience, you couldn't process the feeling, it was too big, it was overwhelming, you weren't psychologically evolved enough to do so. It got swallowed, it got stuck. The feeling is what got stuck. You don't really need the memory, you just wanna release the feeling. So then we go back to what we've been talking about before, allowing space and time, when that part of you feels safe enough to do it, to be with that feeling physically, verbally, however it feels good to you. Like I said though, I can't emphasize this enough, you may not feel safe enough to go there, you may need someone else to hold space at the beginning. If you do, then you can release it in a way that feels good. I teach my clients how to inner parent because that is the person that co-regulates them whilst they're doing it, that helps them feel safe. So to answer your question, you don't need to go back to the womb, you don't need to go back to being one. Ask your psyche for a memory from when a time that you do remember, if for whatever reason you don't get an, an experience that you can kind of hook these feelings onto, that's okay too. You're just gonna feel the feelings, okay? So hopefully that helps. Any other questions? No. Awesome, it's been amazing being in this call with you. Thank you so much for joining and thank you for listening for those of you that are gonna hear this again, recorded version. Um, I'm sending you lots of love. I hope you have an amazing day and see you soon. Now I need to work out how to stop this. <laughs>